Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being patient. Um, so it seems that the lure of online has won. So we've not got very many bodies in the actual room, but uh, in future, uh, we are hoping that we'll have people actually physically come to these sessions. Um, I realise that people are working from home and have busy lives, but that was sort of one of the aims was to get us together in a space so we could connect a bit. Um, but I'm really grateful to um, the rest of the team that have been sort of helping pull this together, to Tony for suggesting it and then backing away really quickly out of the room. Um, and I'm really grateful to um, Maria and Anna for, for um, volunteering to speak um, first in this series of sessions. And just very quickly, um, I thought I would I would kind of go over the ground of, of what we're trying to what, what we're aiming to do, I guess, with these sessions. Um, it's really a chance to share our research projects, um, to learn a little more about what each other are excited about in terms of um, practice in our own fields. Um, and I framed it under this idea of new civic imaginaries, which um, perhaps needs a bit more unpacking. Uh, and, and I became interested in it, in it as an idea because I'm really interested in the writing of Ariella Azule, who's a, a photography theorist, I guess. And she talks about the photograph as a radical space for a civic imaginary. So this idea that, that the, yeah, that the um, the planes of a photograph can be stretched and and kind of reimagined, and so I thought that the seminar series could propose an even more expanded notion of that radical space, um, which could exist across all our disciplines. Um, so if a photograph can hold that kind of radical civic space, then so could a film, so could a building, so could a design, coding, game, a game. You know, I think there's there's room for it to be a really expanded thought. Um, so we're kind of proposing this idea of a, of a shared civil space of ideas that, that belong more to society than they do to the individual or indeed really to the institution. And last week I was listening to Dr. Carola Baum speaking about practice-based research and that really interesting series that Agatha has going on. Um, and I was interested by her reference to the University 3.0. And, and when she was talking about this, I sort of understood her to suggest that this 3.0 iteration of the institution um, is one where the university is no longer the kind of knowledge holder and gatekeeper. It's no longer the, the institution that's pack packaging up knowledge for sort of sale. Um, but it's an institution that understands that knowledge is now everywhere, it's sort of circulating freely. And so therefore the civic role of a university needs to dramatically shift in response to that. And both the people who are speaking who have asked to speak today, um, I think they touch on some of the potential directions of that shift in really interesting ways, both in their practices and in their research. Um, so I'll crack on to them. And first we'd be hearing from Dr. Maria Martinez Sanchez. Um, as some of you probably know, Maria is a senior lecturer and course leader of the BA Architecture um, Honours at Staffordshire University. She's a visiting research fellow at the Faculty of Arts, Design and Media at Birmingham City University and at the School of Architecture of Madrid in Spain. Maria is a PhD architect specialising in the study of space through movement and on methodologies of regeneration involving local communities. So I'm going to pass on to her in a second, but then after that, we're going to hear from Anna Francis. Anna's an Associate Professor of Fine Art and Social Practice at Staffs and a Director at Airspace Gallery and the Portland Inn Project. Anna's an artist and a researcher whose work aims to create space to discuss and reframe city resources through participatory art inventions. And I'm imagining that that both of these people will speak for about 20 minutes um, and then following that, I'm hoping for a, for a bit of a discussion um, between them and with you. So that's that's the format that we're going to be working with. I guess if you do have questions and you're worried about them evaporating from your mind, um, just pop them in the chat and I can gather them up um, at the end and you'll have to excuse any weird fall out from the hybrid nature of us doing this in the real and on teams because we're all just going to bumble through it so thanks very much maria over to you 
Thank you. Just going to try to share the screen. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Good. Yeah. OK, so everyone is able to see it. Great. So thank you, Becky, for the invitation. Uh, I have to admit that I got really excited to be able to talk about uh, my work and the research that I've been doing lately uh, here at Staffs. Uh, and uh, I guess the, the key thing is that all my practice has this uh, interdisciplinary narrative and um, I've been working quite a lot of the works of Cedric Price, especially on his project The Fan Palace. Just to give you a little bit of context, Cedric Price, uh, it's uh, an architect who was born in Stone in Staffordshire and he was really a visionary and proposed uh, I mean, he doesn't have lots of uh, works that have been built, but he has really interesting ideas that have become uh, especially relevant regarding uh, communities, regeneration, but also sustainability. So um, my work has uh, been more around what he has uh, proposed and really trying to give a contemporary uh, idea or a contemporary interpretation of his work. Um, I've been really interested in of the idea of understanding architecture as a script, bringing obviously together uh, the two disciplines of theater and performing arts and, uh, and architecture. But for me, uh, architecture in many ways, it's a narrative, it's a story. Like for example, the one that is behind the, the house of Frida Kahlo and his uh, husband, also the artist Diego de Rivera which actually represents the way in which they were living. So there were two houses, one for her, one for him, and they were just connected by a, a bridge. So it's a, architecture needs to be adapted and needs to be a reflection and represent uh, the ways in which people live, not other things. Uh, also, it's interesting in that sense to, to look into the works of, of Lina Bobardi, uh, especially this Museum of Contemporary Arts in Sao Paulo, which again is a response to how people were living in the city. So she got uh, this amazing project of doing a Museum of Contemporary Arts in uh, Avenida Paulista. And instead of doing a building that starts in the ground floor, what she does is that she elevates that building uh, with the a structure to create a public space for people to gather there. So actually, you know, it's this idea of really understanding who we are, how our society works, and uh, the way in which people come together before making an intervention. And in order to do that, uh, it is really important to analyze projects as the Fan Palace, which essentially is an interdisciplinary project, although it has been mainly studied from the point of view of architecture. Um, when we look into into the archives of uh, the Fan Palace, it comes as a high tech project developed by Cedric Price. However, more than a architecture project, is a theater project, uh, and it comes really from the idea of the theater workshop by Joan Littlewood. Uh, Joan Littlewood, she was a um, um, a theater director who was uh, really bringing all the ideas of Ajit Prop and all the Brechtian theatre uh, into, into the UK through her company, The Theatre of Action. And she had really transgressive and really interesting ideas on what theatre should be and the power that theatre has to transform society. So actually the Fan Palace is not only an architectural project, which, as I said, it was designed by Cedric Price, but it was a project on theatre architecture and cybernetics, because they created a full committee with different disciplines, lots of people being involved. And actually, cybernetics became one of the key elements of it. Just to contextualize a little bit on the on, on when the Fan Palace started, it's, um, it's a moment, uh, the moment of swinging London, where we have the Beatles, there are lots of things happening in the UK, also the Rolling Stones. So there is a moment of, uh, of culture, of uh, lots of richness in terms of social movements as well, 
people really need to start uh, filling in their times. There is a transformation of society. And in order of that, uh, Price and Littlewood just came together and responded to that need uh, through the manifesto of the Fan Palace. So essentially, the Fan Palace is a university of the streets, as she, um, as she presents. It's, it will be a laboratory of pleasure, providing room for many kinds of action. So what it was essential in the work or in this project is the idea of an open-ended space, an open-ended architecture. So they brought together a committee. Uh, well, they had like a group chair and they defined it as, I mean, they created a series of actions that could take place in the Fan Palace. So they defined the inhabitants universe. Why not a trip around the moon in our realistic space capsule simulator? Captain Nemo's cabin, an underwater restaurant, a grotto of kaleidoscopes, the camera Lucinda, the maze of science, the cybernetic cinema, the fantasy generator, climb the tree of evolution, the calligraphic cavern. So, you know, this gives us an idea of the sort of actions, the sorts of things that could happen in that space. Um, the Fan Palace really wasn't a building, it was a matrix, you know, it was in many ways like a computer. Uh, and actually that is supported by the key idea of having cybernetics at the heart of the project. So basically when uh, Gordon Pass comes into the project, he uh, starts uh, bringing this idea that actually that space needs to be a communication space and everything had to do with the way in which people uh, interacted with the building and those communications should be ruled by cybernetics. So basically what they did is trying to you know, they started uh, this idea of the communication. So they were like short term communications, which were, uh, as I said, defined by cybernetics, but also longer term communications, which would be uh, defined by game theory. So all these ideas, all this creation of this machine ended up having as a, as a design of a space, uh, the image that you can see now. So it was a completely open space that could be many different things uh, at its heart as well, had this idea of the of the university. So it was a space where people were invited to come in, uh, to come in. Um, they would, um, it was almost like a socio-cultural experiment in that sense. You know, it really would have had a, ma a massive impact in all the areas. So this project was never built, but uh, during many years there were lots of meetings with the council, etc. until at some point they decided not to build it. But I think it's important to understand uh, the impact that a space like this would have found, would have had in the whole region. Um, also looking at the sort of spaces, the sorts of diagrams, you know, we can see the interdisciplinary nature of the project, the mobility of it, which essentially was more like, a, as I said, like a social machine. So what uh, I've been focusing on uh, with this project, uh, which also was um, was later on, you know, one of the basis of my practice based work was trying to identify the different disciplines, but not only that. Obviously, the fan palace is in between, as I was saying in the beginning, architecture, theater, cybernetics with that sub discipline, which is game theory. But it's about how those disciplines overlap, creating a whole range of new things. So, for example, you know, between architecture and theater, uh, we have performative architecture, which actually um, is a term that has been defined quite recently uh, in a book which is called Performing Architectures by Juliet Ruford, but she also talks about the, the Fan Palace and, and how this new discipline, you know, emerged from it. Uh, also, um, the idea of understanding also the architect as a social engineer, which is when we cross architecture and cybernetics, when the architect also has that control over different behaviors and that is translated in the design. And also in between cybernetics and theater, when Gordon Pask uh, start talking about, well, and he actually defines a manifesto for cybernetic theater, which I will talk later on, but it's really interesting how uh, these key disciplines just by being brought together just uh, allowed to form these kind of subgroups as well um, and also what, what is interesting as i said before uh, quite a lot of the work of joan littlewood uh, in the theater of action was based on the um, on brechtian theater um, so is this idea on how also 
cybernetics takes Brechtian theater in order to be applied to the design of the project. So I was quite interested in all that. And, um, and also, especially about uh, the Manifesto for Cybernetic Theater, I found uh, this document, it's online, it's PDF, but it hasn't been published. However, uh, it, it tells you all the premises of Gordon Pask uh, when, he, when a cybernetician tries to define something that is outside his discipline. Um, and this was the basis for uh, one of the practice-based projects that I developed last year. Uh, which was a, a cybernetic cabaret. So again, this was an interdisciplinary team of people. It was me working on it, a theater director and a, a, a dancer. And what we created was a piece that really explored that idea of cybernetic theater through space. Um, we performed this uh, on the first Cedric Prize Day, which took place at Stafford State University on the 11th of September. I don't know if I'm, oh yeah, I can play the video. But basically, um, it was, um, we created a performance that brought digital live theater. So we were connected at the same time to performers in different parts of the world that were interacting with the audience. But the whole idea was to create a space that allow the people to communicate to each other and with the space, which could create all sorts of open-ended situations, uh, just following the principles of the cybernetic theater by Gordon Pask. So it was more like an installation space with all these elements. And what happened was, you will see it now, that the people came inside and spent some time playing with the space, and that became uh, one of the main parts of the performance. <laughs> So, perfect. <laughs> so, part of um, of as I said, you know, of my current research at the moment is taking uh, these ideas or these uh, starting points that Cedric Price had in his work. As I said, you know, it's extremely relevant now in terms of regeneration, especially you know, looking at uh, one of his key projects, the uh, um, the pottery steam build, because he was making an intervention in this area, trying to bring all the different industri uh, industries together and the railway. And, um, and you know, what we're trying to do at the moment with this project is uh, just start creating a series of events every year, uh, trying to, to show part of his archive. Um, also, next year we will be working more on the idea of the fan palace. So um, the fan palace was never built, but what, had, what has happened is that uh, it has had as a legacy the Fans Palaces project, which is a, a series of events that take place across the UK every year around October. So it, as I said, it wasn't built, but the essence of it, which was based on theater, which was based on this sort of activities, bringing communities together, it's still there, it's still happening, it's still ongoing. And I think that's something that is really powerful. And, and we still, you know, there needs to be a lot of things and a lot of research on what his project uh, had as a legacy. Um, and, and also part of the work that we are developing for next year is looking into other interventions that are happening also uh, nationally that really have uh, that, uh, that work, that essence of the Fan Palace, which uh, Anna's work as well uh, will be part of it because it really uh, embodies that that spirit of actually bringing people together, uh, trying to work with them, and actually you know have an impact in the space. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much what I wanted uh, to talk about. I think I've been all right in terms of time. There is a lot of information, uh, but um, but yeah, I think you know just to summarize, uh, one of the key values is you know, the idea of bringing disciplines together, trying to work uh, across different disciplines, which I think is something that we can just take forward as a department, you know, trying to, I'm not saying that we're going to be doing absolutely the same, but, you know, the fact that we analyze a project and we start finding new areas, like new fields, that uh, means quite a lot, I think. And the other thing is really like, um, you know, how a discipline actually can start uh, developing and spreading into into other disciplines in order just to to make an impact and uh, and have uh, 
an impact in, in society and in, in the way we live. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me just hop back in. Um, you can't, maybe you can't see me, but you can hear me. So thanks very much um, for that, Maria. And we'll come back uh, with some talk, some discussion, but we'll hear from Anna first and then. Um, presentation on for me. It's right. Oh, yeah, so sure. Would you like me to sit here and don't? Well, if you tell me how to move the mic. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Oh, it's on there already. Do you, you want people to see your face first or do you um, want to just. I don't mind. Please? Can they see me? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Can you see Anna? Yes. There you go. <laughs> All right, great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm going to take my mask off. Yes. OK. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to set a timer because I don't want to talk for too long. It's really strange because I can't see you, but you can see me. Um, yeah, <laughs> great. So, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to come and uh, talk about my work, especially um, after hearing from uh, Mariah and I think definitely leading on from a really good introduction to Cedric Price's work. And certainly I think you'll be able to see how his work has really informed the work that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to kind of start by giving a, a bit of a potted history of some of my creative practice. Um, I am an artist and I, I do follow and I'm part of that sort of practice as research approach. Um, and I'm really interested in thinking about the role of the university in our places. And I think um, thinking about how the university can really leak out of our buildings and onto the streets of the city is something that sort of occupies me um, quite a lot within the work that I do. And I think this for me upholds the notion of a connected university that's connected to the community of its place. And so I hope that that kind of will come across in what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and yeah, so so yeah, I've been working in Stoke-on-Trent uh, for for some time, and um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I collaborate uh, with Rebecca Davies and Alice Thatcher and the communities of Portland Street in Stoke-on-Trent, which is in Hanley, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm also a director and studio artist at Airspace Gallery. Um, but to give a kind of history into the, the work I've been doing, I've been really interested in housing renewal um, in cities since 2006, because like a lot of artist, artists, I've been really impacted by what has happened in this city and um, what I've been seen happening on the streets where I live. Um, and I've been all, always questioning, I think, since 2006, the role that artists can have. Um, and the early work was really looking at the housing renewal process and looking at some of the um, pathfinder schemes impact across our streets. So people who've lived in Stoke for some time will remember when there was whole streets being demolished in Stoke. And um, back in 2006, I was aiming to sort of document that process. Um, but since then, my work has moved um, bit further away from documenting and then into thinking about the intervention that creative um, practitioners can make in um, changing the places that we live. A lot of my work is located here in Stoke-on-Trent, um, but it's always in relation to other places. So I, I often go and visit other places where regeneration is taking place and think about what that means to us here in Stoke. I'm also really interested in um, how artists can often occupy the gaps, um, sort of noticing things perhaps that others don't notice and bringing the public to notice with us and to think of possible solutions to some of those gaps. So, um, so for example, um, this early project from 2009 and 10, uh, where I learned that we didn't have a city tour guide in Stoke. And so I became the city's tour guide, but bringing people to regeneration contexts around the city to have conversations a lot of my work um, really involves having a conversation about what's happening and then thinking about what we might do collectively about that change and making change. Um, another project, uh, for example, which happened before our parks um, uh, was awarded the, um, the big heritage lottery funding up, uh, bid that they won, um, uh, common Ground was uh, a series of artworks in the park um, and my particular project looked at the bandstand which I'd never seen used since I first moved here in 1997 
and thinking about you know what that space could become and proposing um, proposing different uses for that and um, so this very quick project to repopulate the bandstand as a way to sort of get people thinking about what happens when <clears throat> we intervene and when we make <clears throat> sorry um, things happen um, just as a way of kind of um, suggesting an, an outcome and then um, seeing if people want to continue to make the change together. Uh, this a project from um, 2010, I was commissioned uh, to take over a disused shop in Stoke Town and um, I set up a TV studio and hosted uh, a talk show and I was the host um, and I invited um, artists and other creative people and also regeneration professionals and people working in the council in policy and housing to come and have conversations about the change happening in the city. Um, I posi positioned myself as a commentator on the processes of change in the city and invited people to question with me um, what role arts might have. And um, I think in sort of in, uh, drawing people's attention to that, um, it creates a space to kind of imagine together, even with decision makers. And I've always tried to make space in the work to have discussion with decision makers and policy makers and to understand who are these people and how do they work and what are their processes. And this is a continuing interest in decision making processes and thinking about who gets to be heard within that and something that I'm quite occupied with currently um, within the work that I'm doing now. Much of the research that um, I've worked on collaboratively with other artists and um, communities in the city uh, really has uh, taken on board an action research process and have actually adapted an action research process um, which uh, was set out by Chemist and McTaggart in 1988, which um, describes action research as a form of collective self-reflective inquiry undertaken by participants in social situations in order to improve the rationality and justice of their own social or educational practices, as well as their understanding of those practices and the situations in which the practices are carried out. And I hope that when I move on to talk about the Portland Inn project, you'll see that actually um, thinking about um, how we can be in charge of um, deci decision making really kind of um, is upheld in this notion of action research. So a lot of the work that I do uses this model. So I'll spend time looking together with others at a context and then making a plan together, <clears throat> thinking about the resources that we can access and assembling um, those resources into an action then enacting that plan and then reflecting back on what's happened before starting that cycle again. And this was really evident in the Spode Rose Garden project, which we began in 2013, where we, uh, we, we took over a triangle in a disused garden space and we renovated everything within that triangle as a way of drawing attention to this abandoned space before um, assembling the support from the uh, people who owned the space and then the community to work together to see that space um, transformed. Um, that space now is a thriving uh, public space which is open um, all year round and we now program creative um, program uh, in, in that space with the community and um, involved people right from the very beginning in thinking about what the space could become and then working together to transform that. And in doing that, I kind of understood that it's really important that people are involved right at the very beginning of a process in order to kind of have a stake in that process and to feel that they um, they're part of it and that they um, they want to see it continue. And this was really important work for kind of thinking about what happened next. A lot of the projects I haven't talked about took me to regeneration contexts across the UK um, on commissions and I was getting quite frustrated by the way that a lot of arts funding is um, short term and that a lot of energy goes into sort of creating some kind of shift or change in a short term way but that as soon as the project has ended all of that energy from the community but from the artists as well um, just dissipates and is gone and I started to think about what happens if um, 
if actually we concentrate that energy and where we live. And also thinking about the way that I felt that often as artists and researchers, um, we are seen as uh, sort of um, aliens to the community. We aren't part of the community and we aren't um, people that actually live somewhere. So I started to think about, you know, <clears throat> what if as an artist and a researcher, I don't go home at the end of the day? And what if my research and practice is focused where I live? What um, sort of longer term impacts can we have um, if we start to kind of work with the people that are our neighbours? Um, coming back to this housing renewal that was happening and kind of my interest in that in the city, around 2013, the City Council announced a, um, a one pound home scheme, which was uh, one of the fallouts from the failed and collapsed regeneration scheme here in Stoke, which I'd been looking at since 2006. And um, at the same time, my partner and I found out we were having a child. And so we were thinking about, um, you know, uh, having a stake in the community and having a home. And so we applied to the one pound house scheme and we were really interested because um, to uh, have, be a one pound homeowner, you had to contribute to community life and you had to agree to support community development. And as a researcher, I found the idea of that really interesting and uh, really wanted to kind of think about what that might mean uh, with a community. So um, we moved into our new home in 2014 and very quickly I started to think about how my um, my previous work um, in the city looking at regeneration and my work as a, a practicing artist could kind of start to answer some of these questions about what community development looks like um, and if you get involved in developing your own community. <clears throat> the, the approach uh, has always um, been uh, based on um, asset-based community development, which is um, to say that it is not a deficit model, sort of looking at what's wrong with the place and um, trying to kind of make change, um, but instead kind of looking at perhaps what works. So the, the very earliest uh, projects asked, um, yes, what needs work, but also what works here. So recognising that communities are full of skills and treasures and um, the uh, the um, there's a, a really great project called the Movement for Neighbourhood Democracy and Angela Fell, who runs that, talks about um, the, the treasures of community and how you can kind of tap into those and um, something that we aim to do with the work that we're doing on Portland Street. So very quickly, we started to talk with our community about what worked and what our gifts might be and to think about actually where energy could be um, placed for kind of making positive change for and with the community. Um, the initial project was to create a community ceramic because what I learnt was that this community, which had been through a really challenging time as a result of the failed and collapsed um, uh, regeneration scheme, had seen their, their sort of neighbours moved out and there was a lot of antisocial behaviour in the area, um, lots of uh, drug dealing and uh, problematic buildings and the kind of physical landscape in the area is, you know, um, still quite challenging. Um, so um, my idea was to kind of uh, create a community ceramic which celebrated the area, but of course that's not necessarily what a community with so many different challenges needs. And so very quickly um, the project, which was all about kind of looking at um, how to kind of um, work together to make this place better for the people living there, we learnt that um, yes, a community ceramic is a nice idea, but it doesn't really make a massive difference. So the community told us what we really need is a space to come together. The one pound home scheme looked at improving some of the kind of built environment via some of the housing, but didn't really think about what happens in between the buildings. What actually makes a community isn't necessarily the buildings, it's what happens in between or an, and inside those buildings. And so we started to think about that together and um, the community told us um, the pub, the shop, the community centre are still all boarded up. Um, how do you become a community if you've got nowhere to meet and nowhere to work? So uh, as a result of those questions, the City Council offered us the use of the disused pub. They said, you're telling us the community wants a space, then prove it. So from the beginning, we started to think about what if the community owned this building? What if it were open every day? And what can happen here and who can be involved? And so we started asking those questions um, in 2016 via a four week arts programme, which occupied um, the just about usable two downstairs rooms in the building. 
And we ran lots of sessions over um, four weeks. I think we had 53 sessions across four weeks um, at all different times of day. Um, but really, it was all about asking questions of the community about what the building could become in order to inform the writing of a business plan with the community for, for this pub building. Um, which we handed to the council in 2016 and um, we then advocated for an asset transfer of the pub building which was finally granted in 2018. Um, since between that time we continued to programme cultural activity and campaign for the building to be transferred and the community were kind of with us um, every step of the way. When we got the asset transfer in 2018, we um, ran an arts council programme called Raising the Roof. Um, and we worked with Baxendale architects who specialise in community co-building. Our idea is that the community will transform the pub um, together. So we will go in and kind of renovate and change the building together. So we wanted to test out what a community co-build would look like. So we built a temporary workshop on the street because by that stage the pub was no longer habitable. Um, the Raising the Reef programme saw a whole range, again across four weeks, of different uh, activity happening and certainly sort of thinking about how um, our programme could become almost a university of the streets. We ran ceramics workshops, architecture school, kids cafe, boxing club, fashion sessions, glass making, gardening, film club, radio workshops, drawing and all sorts of other things. Um, but really importantly, our community became architects in our architecture school for a week and um, thought about redesigning the pub building together. Um, as I said, our processes are really informed and inspired by alternative spaces for um, learning like the Pottery's Think Belt, Cedric Price's really groundbreaking work, which was a critique of the traditional university system. Um, for example, our Portland Think Belt was our summer programme this summer and um, actually brought our young people through a whole range of different activities and skills development. Um, and. Uh, and also led to some formal qualifications. So 20 of our young people achieved an arts award um, over the last two summers. Um, and we also uh, really inspired by the Black Mountain College, which is another alternative um, learning space. Um, for us, it's all been about um, not just kind of cr uh, creating physical change, but also changing the rhetoric of the area, because usually when our community and area is in the news, it's for bad reasons. Um, but uh, through the project, we've been able to start to sort of change what people know about the area. So we were um, we were shortlisted for the Reba McEwen Award, which is um, the award which uh, recognises architecture for the common good um, back in uh, 2019 and our project the Raising the Roof building was on the front cover of the Reba Journal. This doesn't impress the kids on the street um, but it does get the project known about um, externally. We were granted planning permission for the building in December 2020 and due to some of the Covid kind of um, uh, I don't know uh, hiccups we are um, still in a tendering process, we've got three bids come in from potential builders and we're hoping to get underway in spring with the building um, and we're really excited about that process. Um, and really for us, the building is a catalyst for community development. So there will be this kind of physical change, but um, we've also been really lucky to receive funding um, from a creative civic change programme uh, to think about everything that is not the building. So everything that uh, else that a, a community project like ours needs, um, thinking about how we um, can create a safe and secure environment for our communities to work within um, in the midst of quite still significant um, um, challenges, um, how we can strengthen our organisation by um, thinking longer term and uh, develop skills in the community which will be able to kind of input to um, the long term project. Uh, we've through this process been able to identify um, that we needed to think about how our communities can be involved in decision making. So since 2019, the beginning of 2019, we set up a community decision making panel where um, our community members can come and uh, uh, vote on what we work on, what our money gets spent on and how things um, happen. 
And we're in the process of setting up a youth board um, because we've recognised that our young people don't want to come to our boring meetings, which aren't that boring because we usually have a meal, but um, that they would like to still be involved in decision making. So we're just in the process of setting that up um, currently. So I mentioned um, asset based community development um, and that this is all about empowering communities to assemble their strengths into new combinations, new structures of opportunity, new sources of income and control and new possibilities for production. And this is very much um, how we work on the street with our community. Um, what we're working on now, I've just got one more minute to tell you about. So, um, OK. <laughs> So um, as a result of COVID, quite a lot of our pr uh, programmes, which are very much on the street and kind of out in the open air, um, we had to really th think about, um, you know, how we continue to support our community. So a lot of the work that we did, um, we, we did have an online programme, but very quickly we needed to be back out on the street and we handed out um, lots of creative packs to our community and to our families during the time when we couldn't meet um, and one of the packs that we gave out um, was uh, for a sunflower growing competition and it's really simple but it was really interesting because just from that very simple idea some of the community who just have these very small backyard spaces started to grow things for the very first time and what we realized was that there was an interest from the community in thinking about our sort of small yard spaces as part of an ecology and um, and so as a result of that we commissioned some extra work to kind of consider um, the environment and our local ecologies and the contribution that we can make to those longer term. Um, we started working with Andrea Koo, who is a biodiversity specialist and a gardener and a beekeeper. And from March 2021, she came and worked with our residents to really think about how we can improve um, those small spaces and also started talking to us about um, thinking longer term and thinking more sustainably. I mentioned that frustration with arts practices and projects, which are usually short term as a result of how a lot of arts is funded. And um, via the work that we've started to do on Portland Street, we've started to think longer term. So um, we started to think about what if um, we had actually a 100 year plan for our neighbourhood. We were really inspired thinking about people like Capability Brown and thinking about landscapes like the one just up the road at Trenton and um, which he was designing, you know, a few hundred years ago, um, thinking about if you're designing something that you're never going to see the outcome of, um, how does that work and what does that look like and how can the change that we make today still have a stake in you know what happens then? Um, we started to think about that in relation to our community and our neighbourhood, recognising that when Capability Brown was um, sort of thinking about his work, not only was he um, thinking about this kind of long term landscape, he was also attending to these tiny details within the garden. And thinking about that in relation to our project has been so important um, that we, as kind of um, creative leads on the project, might need to have this overview, but our community doesn't always want to know everything, but they may do. So we've kind of opened up our processes for people. If they want to kind of focus in and know the detail, they can. If they want to have the overview, um, making all of our processes of decision making really visible have been key to that. But also thinking long term, we're able to consider how the the smaller parts of our projects are funded in terms of a long long term large scale landscape um, this has led us to do lots of different things one of the things we've worked on is um, fern bricks last summer which were um, we started making bricks on the street and this is because a lot of our backyard spaces are actually north facing and don't get much light and our community were talking about what can I grow in that space and it it sort of demonstrates the way we work sort of look at a local problem a dark space and think about how we might design something together, thinking about the history. We learned that there used to be brick making on the site where we work um, and then designing together a fern brick, which we then made on the street last summer, which was displayed at British Ceramics Biennial. 
We're now working on sort of um, scaling up the 100 year plan um, recognizing that other communities could really sort of use one. And we are working with create with um, the local trust uh, to develop an influencing tool and um, which takes the formation of the 100 year plan for and with communities and works with communities, councils, policymakers and funders to de define what methods and formats work best for communicating tools like this. We have recognised that we need way more points of interaction between communities and policymakers to share experience and practice um, so that those that experience the fallout of decision makers can speak directly about what that experience looks and feels like. And, and we're now working on really understanding who policymakers are so that we can share that learning with other communities and to also support them in making their own long term plans. So, um, so yeah, that's that's where we're at right now. Um, and uh, it's a, quite an exciting and busy time for the work. And um, and yeah, it would be great to kind of um, see if there are any questions for me or Maria. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anna. Right. Well, that's a good one. Okay. Um, let me stop screen sharing. How will I do that? Where's my technician? There we go. Have I stopped screen sharing people in the room? Oh, great. Try not to try to ignore the <laughs> marks. A massive breach of all the university protocols there. Um, <clears throat> OK. Um, is that are they gone now? No. no. Oh, what? No, they not. OK, OK. You can see them. <laughs> Why are they still there? Hold on. OK, well, let me just if I just close word, perhaps. There we go. Right. Sorry about that. So brilliant. I'm not quite sure how we'll do the next bit. Maybe I will. Um, hmm. Bring the laptop yeah. over here. Disconnect from the screens. OK, I'm going to travel you over to where our speakers are sitting and we will have a chat. OK, the hybrid blended environment. Look how well it works. OK, so we maybe sit closer. Why don't you two sit uh, on the double ends of there? I've got, I've got, I think we may have to take out the, um, I'm just keeping my mask on because I've got uh, family COVID, <laughs> so I haven't got it, but my partner and my child does, so I'm just going to keep this on while we're close. Yes, that's fine and um, very good. So, okay, thank you both. I've got maybe a couple of questions. What are you saying, Ray? Can I take out the blur background? So we, yes. Yeah. This is all my plan, you see, for interdepartmental collaboration. It's already working in this moment. <laughs> OK, so maybe I might just ask an initial question to, that you both might want to um, talk about together. Okay. And then I haven't even looked in the chat, um, mm. but uh, maybe then we could just uh, field some questions from the group. Um, so I think. I was struck by lots of things, but in terms of the sort of synergies and the and the connectivity between both of those talks, I thought maybe this seems simplistic, but you were really addressing maybe or highlighting the kind of the subversive sort of activism that's present in that idea of the University of the Streets, mm -hmm. or certainly present in those blueprints, mm -hmm. Cedric Price's kind of um, dreamings i suppose and then anna you seem to almost be fleshing out the detail of how that blueprint might become an actual tool for change mm -hmm. which i think was really do you guys see that as a and mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm thinking about that kind of initial activist slightly subversive mm -hmm. maybe seems a bit well more than a bit impractical like how would it ever be a thing mm -hmm. in the world do you mm -hmm. see do you mm -hmm. see that leading to this yeah. sort of thing is that a question? Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's uh, interesting is that the Fan Palace really is a very political project because in some ways the materialization, sorry, uh, the materialization of 
Rex ideas that comes, as I said, from the revolution, agit prop, etc. Um, so it's really interesting the way you have defined it as a subversive, uh, you know, the subversive idea of the University of the Streets. Uh, I don't think it's that subversive in the sense that that's how we should be working with people. So we cannot see the work with people as subversive, but something that is necessary. I think um, something that you said, Anna, that really I think I wrote down is what makes a community is what happens in between the buildings. Mm -hmm. So a university in a way is what it happens in between the spaces where we live. You know, when we did here at university, we're not only in the university, but we're taking the students everywhere. So somehow it addresses this sort of programs. Uh, which has to do with where we develop our everyday life, which I think in that sense is pretty much what um, you're working on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, it, it's not a surprise really, I think, to see that our work is very much informed by um, Cedric Price. We find his his ideas really exciting. Um, and uh, I suppose, um, you know, we are now thinking about actually how do you make how do you make those real and what does that mean for the communities of, of that place because i don't know whether or not the reason that the, his ideas didn't happen is because um i don't know did he did he involve enough people or the right people in the work mm -hmm. um i don't know mm -hmm. i feel like maybe it's it's something around that yeah yeah i think uh, especially in the case of the fan palace it was about to happen in many places but um because it has different locations and a couple of times was about to happen but it was stopped and i wonder whether uh, as you say there wasn't enough involvement of the community mm -hmm. uh, in that sense even though it was a project that was for the community and it came from you know some sort of applied theater which is uh, what the only table was with with theater workshop but yeah i guess you highlighted one of the key things which is the gap between communities and policy makers mm -hmm. policy makers and how do you actually facilitate those uh, those conversations, which I think uh, um, we still struggle to do, because it seems that things happen in in many different ways, and mm -hmm. and also actually how how when you're doing these sorts of projects, how do they become sustainable as well later on? So I think that's a very interesting reflection. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I think we've just in the last uh, perhaps the last year become quite. Uh, obsessed with the notion of policy makers and decision makers because um, we're part of the creative civic change uh, program which is happening across 15 uh, neighborhoods across across um, England and um, all doing similar kind of work but bespoke to those neighborhoods and all I think um, finding that actually the notion of a policy maker is, is a bit of an alien one to communities. So mm -hmm. um, and, and because we're really interested in decision making processes as part mm -hmm. of the work that we're doing and um, to understand a little bit more about decision making at other levels, I mm -hmm. think is something that we've now got quite excited about. And so just this this uh, last few weeks, we've been thinking about the artist placement group, which um, which uh, was so interesting as a project, which brought artists to uh, different contexts. And actually their very famous phrase, the context is half the work, um, is something we're really interested in. So they they ran creative residencies in factories and offices and um, all sorts of places as a kind of um, a trust in the process of artists to kind of uncover creatively um, all sorts of fascinating things. Mm -hmm. But for me, thinking about how um, if we as creative practitioners could get access into policymakers offices to then kind of make visible some of those processes um, and then to share that with communities, it would, um, I think, kind of open things up so much more because I know I go to conferences and there's lots of people doing this mm -hmm. work, but we all are always talking to the same kind of people. So we're talking to other communities who are working in this way or other artists mm. who are working this way. But it's very rare that you actually have the policymakers and the governmental kind of offices and um, there with yeah. the community kind of um, learning from each other. So. So yeah, this this 100 year plan influencing tool, which we're kind of aiming to work on now, and um, we're taking a very similar approach where the way that we normally work is um, with the community, kind of look together, make a plan together, 
Um, but what we haven't done before is to bring the policymakers in at the beginning mm. and start to think actually about, you know, how do they want, what formats do they want to hear from us in? And, mm. um, you know, so it's, it's quite exciting. Yeah, but... I think because I was working quite a lot on this before uh, in urban planning. Well, in urbanism, we work quite a lot with participatory urbanism and there are lots of uh, consultation processes. However, uh, the consultation processes are quite direct, asking communities like, what do you want? Do you want here a street? Do you want like, so I think uh, those processes actually, they need to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something um, that uh, should be done in collaboration, you know, with architects as well, with urban planners, because uh, I think arts practices are able to unlock much more knowledge about place than uh, just direct questions because you know there is a lot about this unconscious experience of the place so basically when you're doing arts projects with the communities you find out a lot about the identity of the place you may ask directly the you know the community so what do you think about where you live what do you think this needs to be done and they may answer things that may not be that accurate but through different sort of artistic methodologies i think it's um it would be really good to actually unlock and you know understand that knowledge. So I think through collaborations between, as I said, urban planners or people um, who are really engaged in participatory urbanism, bringing those processes within communities would be really, really good. And I think uh, also it would be like a way of a bridge in between policymakers and arts practice. I don't know if you've had done any work with, um, with urban planners in terms of uh, developing um, not with this project. Uh, we did uh, with a with a, a different project. We were working. Um, we we brought in some urban planners to a project based in London, which was thinking about um, sort of uh, gentrification processes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we are just in the in the process of setting up an advisory board, and we have been talking about who should be on that advisory mm -hmm. board. So we have our decision making panel and they will sit, the advisory board will sit below them. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been recognizing that at, at certain points we need to be able to bring in expertise mm -hmm. um, and to kind of, we usually collaborate with all sorts of different people. So we might collaborate with gardeners and architects and all sorts of people mm -hmm. over the years. And we are sort of recognizing that, um, you know, it could be good to, we tried to kind of work a little bit with our planning office at the, mm -hmm. the city council. <laughs> we found that quite yeah. challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I think plan planning processes and, you know, urban planners are, um, well, talking to them, they were talking about how they go into the practice of urban mm -hmm. planning with really good intentions, but then the kind of the rules um, and the kind of the, the, the laws around everything kind of makes, makes it really difficult to kind mm -hmm. of keep those radical approaches yeah. um, in practice, uh, particularly if you're working in city council planning mm. offices, I think, yeah. yeah. Well, just, sorry. sorry, Marie, I'm just going to, because I'm conscious that I said, I think Hugh's fielding questions. Are you? Did you have a question? Oh, I had a question. Oh, OK. Yeah. But I, I, other people, you need to start coming up with questions. I'm trying to get them to get the question. Oh. Um, is there, do, do you look at it as from an international perspective, either of you, in terms of I, perhaps, perhaps slightly more to you, Anna, but I think it, both mm -hmm. of you, in the sense of are people looking at some of these ideas in other countries? Are there similar urban areas that are looking at similar solutions to their challenges? Are you sharing across in an international perspective? Um, <clears throat> I think we we have mainly been sort of sharing our work nationally. Um, and uh, not so much internationally, but when we have sort of touched on, you know, thinking about the processes that, that we're, the way that we're working, um, we've been told that this is quite different to how other countries and, and the possibilities, the way that we've been able to kind of um, push forwards change is quite different mm. than in, in lots of other places. And um, yeah, so, so yeah, I don't know if the the planning processes. You'll probably know more than I will. Um, well, I've no few cases, few case studies in South America. Um, um, yeah, I think just okay. It's a really different reality because obviously we have the slums there, and um, and there are quite a lot of things happening, but there is not that strong. Um, 
you know, in those spaces just because of the nature of how they have been developed and what is happening in them and the social circumstances. There is a little bit more of freedom mm -hmm. in terms of working with the communities in that sense. Um, but I've, yeah, I have uh, some colleagues that have worked in, you know, as I said, participatory urbanism and all that. And that's why, um, but again, not through arts practice, which I think uh, there is always some sort of workshop, some, you know, some sort of um, engagement activities with the communities, but more di direct, like not that not that much facilitated by artists. So I just think that there is like a scope there of exploration, both nationally and internationally. Yeah, yeah. And I think so the neighborhood, the movement for neighborhood democracy that I was mentioning, which is a UK uh, based uh, movement um, are doing really good work at connecting um, out and um, really, really fascinating work. I mean, the, a lot of the work that I have done really draws on Nabil Hamdi's, um, I really recommend everyone to read Nabil Hamdi's Small Change. Um, it's such a good book and it, and it does look actually at sort of a lot of development contexts and um, and the way that actually out, operating outside of the usual kind of laws and policy um, can be a really good way of kind of getting things going and, and growing and sort of, you know, this notion of kind of assembling your resources, even if those resources are sometimes quite scant and then sort of making small change in order to and then thinking kind of longer term and bigger. Um, yeah, I found that really, really interesting. So and that's very much an international perspective. But, um, but the projects that he talks about in in that are um, are very small scale, but thinking sort of about the kind of global kind of uh, implications of that kind of small small intervention. Just I just the thought that maybe it's an interesting point to note as well that in terms of this sort of um, embedded work happening internationally. Um, it, it potentially isn't happening internationally in the Western paradigm, but it certainly happens, you know, within indigenous mm -hmm. communities and yeah. it kind of always has. It's a model that, that just exists within, say, the Maori yeah. community. So um, we're probably looking in the wrong places yeah. some of the time, you mm -hmm. know, for, um, mm -hmm. for, for parallel um, iterations because yeah. your 100 year plan and and um which i really love that idea but but maori uh talk about a thousand year plan yeah they live with that That's <laughs> so we're really like thinking too it. short yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's too short term and <laughs> go further yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. i can't see the screen is no, there anything no, there's no, nothing no there's tumbleweed questions come on hugh we want a question from you hugh oh we'll always <laughs> take hand up I, I, I knew you were landing in it, Tony. Um, can I can I ask actually both of you then? How how do you see your respective um, research informing your curriculum? How 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 do you work with students with with this work? Was it a question? Not 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 that you were going to be mean, you. <laughs> That's a really good question, I think, because we can all learn from that. I yeah, I think for me, so. Um, I, most of the teaching that I do is um, is the kind of flipping of um, the kind of usual hierarchies I think that happen in universities where it's you know I'm the font of all knowledge and I'm going to um, tell you what you need to know and very much the Portland Inn project is instead of kind of someone being in charge and someone being an expert it's thinking about what um, what skills do we have together and how can we learn together and actually how do we define what we even want to learn together and so a lot of the, the kind of the teaching practice that I do and even kind of individual sessions will always have that kind of participatory nature and um, within them and um, I remember when I was first in teaching and a mentor that I had was talking he always talked to me about the notion of the jug and the mug and that you know I'm the jug and the student is the mug. <laughs> and I always found that really, really terrible to kind of think of it in those terms. I'm not going to fill you up with my kind of knowledge. And um, that's like the opposite. And so my approach is always, you know, no, we're going to we're going to learn this together and we're going to go on this journey together. And I'm going to learn as much from you as you can learn from me. And yeah, yeah, I think sometimes 
sometimes that's that's quite mm -hmm. hard and you're kind of you're you're in the classroom as much as um as everyone else um but yeah that totally informs the approach that i have to to mm. um to learning actually yeah well in my case i think because of the discipline and architecture is a discipline that is really connected to the place where we live and the way we experience space and space we cannot experience it through drawings you really need to go to places you need to smell you need to listen to the sound you need to do everything uh, I try to base my teaching pretty much on life projects, so trying to set up uh, connections with uh, partners and trying to get the students to really understand that it's a life subject that needs to be approached, uh, you know, not sitting comfortably with the heating, especially in Stoke because it rains a lot. But <laughs> what I mean is that it's we really need to to get the students to learn that it's all about going to sites, moving around, um, exploring, and that's something that you need to do it physically. And, uh, and, and and that's something that I cannot really teach in the studio. So that's a very important element of my practice mm -hmm. as a pedagogue, I guess. Yeah. Sure. yeah. OK, thank you. Good. Does anyone else have, she says, peering in from miles away at the back of the table. Does anyone else have anything, that, any comment or question they might like to bring up at this point? No, I'm not seeing anything. Well, look, um, thank you both. And I could keep on chatting about this for quite a while, and perhaps we will after we close the meeting <laughs> off. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you both coming and, and doing this slightly strange yeah. <laughs> semi-virtual um, seminar. So, um, and we will, now that this is off the ground, um, I, there are, well, we've got this really for the rest of the um, session almost until, I don't know what that noise is, until um, the end of the semester or until the end of the academic year. But I'm going to publish the schedule and there are still a couple of gaps and I would really love um, for those of you that might still want to um, put yourself forward to share your your research projects to do that. And, um, and if there are more offers than there are gaps, that'd be great because we're looking to sort of solidify this next year and, and keep it running. Mm. So um, we can check back in with Anna's hundred year plan hopefully <laughs> yeah. in you know some months and and see where it's going and I think that would be that I really invite people with live projects um you know research that's still in a slightly confused place maybe or you know <laughs> let's hear some problems as well as some neatly resolved solutions I think that's mm. sort of what the forum's for in a way um to test some ideas on each other and 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 have a little bit of critical discussion around our theories and our our kind of imaginings. Um, yeah, I, I would really love to see some of that happening. So mm -hmm. I will be in touch with you all and thank you for tuning in and um, we'll have some snacks next time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gonna sign off and I'll make the recording available for those who missed. Thank you.